and they will, in this case, scoured 18 inches. So if you were out there during a storm event, the bed would have been 18 inches lower. But then as the storm started to tail off, the material from upstream that was in suspension and moving down starts to fall out because you don't have enough energy to keep it moving. Okay, that's just a natural thing. And in this case, we had, in this riffle right here, we had eight inches. The bed increased eight inches. The bed actually lowered two inches on this side. So we had variability in the same riffle. What about the next one upstream? We only had six inches of scour, but we had one inch of deposition on top of that. So we only had this much variability in the riffle upstream. We had like this much variability in the riffle that we were looking at here. Okay? Those are, nat those are natural tendencies in gravel bed rivers. Bottom line is sediment moves, whether we like it or not, and it's going to continue to move. And there's a lot of sediment in the Rogue River, and it's natural sediment in the Rogue River. So when we talk about tendencies of what's going to happen, we're going to see that sediment move through the system. Okay? So I will be at the water resources uh, poster. So if you have questions about sediment, feel more than free to come up and ask me about questions in particular. We are also meeting with landowners at the Gold Ray Estates. Uh, as well to address their concerns about sediment and talk about what we found as far as the sediment. So we're keyed in on this as a, as a significant issue and we're aware of it and so we're dealing with it. So that's the wetlands. Then we talked about the hydraulic modeling and sediment modeling. Now I want to talk real briefly about the cultural resources and the, the different types of significant cultural resources. We had uh, George Kramer here that lives in Ashland, did the uh, historical preservation kind of. We have the above ground, and then we have the below ground type of historical resources. And above ground, we found out, or George found out, Kramer found out that the, the Gold Ray Dam is eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And he also found that it would be an adverse effect if it were removed, okay? If it's on the National Register or, or eligible, then it would be an adverse effect, obviously. There are mitigation options to deal with uh, National Historic uh, Places. And so those a plan can be developed so that the information, the, the different parts of the dam, components of the dam, would be documented, some of them salvaged and utilized in a historical interpretation center uh, that would be available for people to learn about the dam and the National Historic Place uh, that it is. So that's dealing with it from a historical preservation. That report is not yet available, uh, but will be uh, coming up down the road here as far as available. But this is essentially the findings is that um, it is eligible for a National Register of Historic Places. That's the above ground. The below ground or the archaeological uh, impacts or potential impacts uh, was done by Mark Tabeskoff, also of Ashland in uh, Southern Oregon University, who's done a lot of uh, resource management around here and, and looking into archaeological issues, and basically identified a couple sites, primarily where the um, historical residence was and a lot of old uh, pop bottles and different types of cans and things like that. But the bottom line is, in his report and study was, avoid those areas that are culturally significant. And we have, um, obviously, where the dam is located um, can avoid that area pretty easily. The other thing is that there's an existing timber crib dam upstream of the existing concrete dam. One of the recommendations out of Mark's report was to make sure that we document that with photos and even uh, saving pieces of it potentially and using that as part of the interpretive center as well. And then the other thing, you can't see below water to look at archaeological significant issues. So typically, in, in the recommendation from Mark's report was, once the reservoir <coughs> has gone down, if dam removal is the option, then a survey of that area obviously would be uh, recommended and required as part of the dam removal uh, process. So that's cultural resources and historical preservation. Now what I'd like to do is jump into and talk about if dam removal is the preferred option that's selected, we have to look at what that plan would look like. 
And so in order to do a good job with the environmental assessment and what the impact would be, you have to understand how the dam would be taken out. And so therefore, we developed a plan for taking the dam out. It's a multi-phase plan that ensures fish passage uh, for the majority of the time, minimizes disturbance to existing fish that are migrating during this time, and it's based on standard methods that have been used um, you know, on the Rogue River and other rivers around uh, to ensure that things go well, so to speak, during the dam removal. So this is the plan, the two-phase approach, where basically you isolate one side of the dam, take it out, then turn the river into that, and then take out the other side of the dam. So you can see here, basically looking at a plan view, phase one being taking out this side, phase two taking out the rest of the dam, fish ladder, and powerhouse as well. The sequence that something like that could happen if it were removed is shown here, where we have copper dams, and these copper dams uh, are essentially uh, rocks and uh, alluvi uh, natural gravels that would be placed in here to be able to access across Tolo Slough. This copper dam could be built and then all of the fish and anything else in Tolo Slough could be removed in a controlled environment, still not affecting anything going on in the river at that point. Then the next phase would be to go ahead and construct a copper dam out into the middle of the existing dam. And then that area there could be isolated this portion here, this is the copper dam that would isolate this half, defish this and get everything else out of here, and then now you've started to create yourself a controlled environment to work in and remove concrete. Looking at it from a little bit different perspective here, from an aerial view, basically you would take step one is build a copper dam there in the red. Step two would be to make sure you get all of the fish and other aquatic organisms out of Tolo Slough. Step three would be to build a copper dam out to the middle of the existing dam, which would be around July 1st is the date that would be the primary uh, target date for doing that. Remove all the aquatic species, obviously. Then you'd have to have a small little copper dam downstream to isolate the dam so that you don't have fish coming up into uh, that area while you're working and to get all of the water or help remove the water as much as possible. And then you would take that portion of the dam out. Now during this phase one and phase two, you have to have a fish passage plan. You can't just go out and change the river and move things around and, and take out dams without having fish passage. As we know, living on the Rogue River, you have some kind of an adult fish in here all year long. It's the bottom line. And so we want to maintain fish passage throughout this entire duration of fish, uh, of dam removal, if that's the case. So a fish passage plan has to be approved by the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Marine Fishery Service, NIMS. And so they, a plan has been put together, a draft plan, that they have reviewed and are in the process of reviewing and commenting on to ensure that fish passage is protected uh, for the duration of the project. Then, once this side of the dam is removed over here, then you can divert the river into this area here and take out the right hand side of the dam in a pretty much isolated area where you wouldn't have a whole lot of water, if any water, in that area. Your fish passage would be maintained on that side there with the black arrow. So you can see the red and the orange there isolating the powerhouse fish ladders and then your fish passage there in the black arrows up and downstream where the river could be diverted. Ah, Marmot Dam. So how do you deal with these coffer dams and make sure that you don't have some kind of a failure or some kind of a big problem with your coffer dam? This is an example of Marmot Dam. I don't know if you if you followed this very much, but it came out in 2007. They built a humongous gravel coffer dam and then basically just let that thing fail on its own in pretty much in an uncontrolled fashion when they got a big flood they started to let it over top and they kind of dug out a little bit and then it pretty much catastrophically failed and they were okay with that. They had about a million cubic yards of material behind the dam um, that was upstream and they just let it all go. And so we're not planning that type of a, a removal exercise here. 